Next question is from CMOS23. What would you tell a client who was told they only have to train with partial reps or a limited range of motion to save their joints? Oh, I remember when I figured this out, it was a panty dropper. For sure. <laughs> for sure it's going to stick. Yeah, yeah it, for real. It is going <laughs> to stick. stick. I'm using it, dude. I'm All using right, it. that's fine. I I'm figured you I'm would. I'm adjust it. I'm uh, using yeah. this one. So here, no, here's the thing, okay? You want to train, and this is where people get confused uh, with ranges of motion. Do I train in a full range of motion? Do I train in a partial range of motion? It's very individual. You want to train in the fullest range of motion, and here's the important part, that you have control over, okay? So the fullest range of motion that you have control over. What does this look like for you? It can be very different in, in terms of what it looks like for you than what it would look like for someone else. So when I would train somebody who had poor mobility, uh, somebody who wasn't, you know, didn't have lots of stability and strength, sometimes that meant we would do squats, and the squats would be to start with a quarter squat. Um, because anything lower than a quarter squat, they didn't have the stability to support that range of motion and the risk of injury was too high or we would end up training uh, a movement pattern that wasn't good, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't, it doesn't stop there though. Then I would try to improve the person's functional range of motion. So if all we can do are quarter squats because you lack the mobility and stability to do a full <laughs> squat, I will do quarter squats, but I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to do exercises and correctional movements to increase and improve your range of motion because the best way to live life, the best way to develop muscle and strength is to have long ranges of motion that you control, yeah. be able to own all ranges of motion. Now your risk of injury is really well, low. An example I think of uh, immediately with this, uh, which was uh, one of my clients that had like frozen shoulder. And so this was something that was just a real debilitating, uh, you know, had like no range of motion, could barely even lift his arm up to about chest height, right? And so that's what I had to work with. And so we had to go very gradually uh, into different ranges of motion and we could only do what we could could do. And so a lot of it looked like actually isometrics where we'd find that in range and then we would connect to it yes. and then try and pull up on his own. So a lot of it was all his own effort with pulling away. So if I put, for instance, so if I put his hand on the wall and, and I try to get it up as high as I can where he's pushing on the wall at his highest uh, point of, of range of motion to now connect to that. So he's going to squeeze into it. But now he also has to try and pull off of the wall. Uh, that was a totally different uh, type of of an exercise that had massive benefit that was a really gradual increase in range of motion over time, but it's totally different mindset. I think you guys are both missing the point here. This, this, uh, and neither one of you are slamming the shit of the person who gave this advice. Like, you guys are both making cases for where you would use partial reps, right. and it makes sense instead of slamming core squats. It, yes, it, well, instead of slamming this person that is telling the save uh, your joints, yeah, yeah. To, to do partial reps to save your joints. Yeah, you're right. Like you guys are making like which I, I understand the where you're going. Like yeah, absolutely. Like there's uh, been cases where we as trainers used partial reps with a client for the exact reasons that both of you just just defended. But if someone is telling a client. You should do partial reps to save your joints. That is some of the it's worst advice. advice. That's terrible advice mm -hmm. because what you're going to do is train them to train them to be strong and controlled in that shortened range of motion. And anything outside of that, their joints will be more vulnerable. Right. So that's the last thing that I'd want to do. Like now, that doesn't mean that you know we don't or we're not careful with going full range of motion. Like maybe like like to Sal's point, when this person squats, their form breaks down after a quarter squat, and so therefore you would take the, the precautions that Sal and Justin are talking about. But as far as just general advice, this is terrible advice that you should not, you know, limit your range of motion, especially if you already have it. Mm -hmm. If you have full range of motion in your shoulder and you think, oh, this is going, and someone's telling the, this person that them doing partial reps is going to save their joints and, and you're going to get more out of it long term. Yeah. No, that's terrible. You're not preparing them for real world uh, oh. activities and function uh, because nobody's living in those short ranges of motion constantly. I mean, there's so many more no. variables. To no, consider. it has to be appropriate, of course. Um, and the goal is always to increase the range of motion. So if you if you are using partial reps, you have to also train yourself to be able to use full of reps. The problem is this. The problem is, is that we often confuse the human body with uh, machinery that we use in everyday life, right? So if I use uh, a particular tool or machine, the more I use it, 
the more wear and tear there is on it. And and the the le- it's not gonna it has a certain shelf life, right? So over time, if I continue to use a door hinge over and over again, it wears down, and that's bad for the door hinge. This is not how the human body works. The human body, yes, you get wear and tear, but that sends a signal for repair and strengthening. This is why muscles build. I wear and tear on them when I work out. They get they build and they get stronger. Not sending that signal act- actually causes more problems. Yeah, atrophy. So, so for joint health, the best possible thing you could do is move them through appropriate ranges of motion and build strength within them. That'll keep your health your joints healthy. Not moving your joints actually speeds up the degradation process. It actually speeds up or amplifies your risk of injury. So, and then you think, okay, well, what about people that overuse their limbs and, and hurt themselves? It's totally different. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about overuse. I'm not talking about overcoming your body's ability to adapt and strengthen. And I'm not talking about strengthening a bad recruitment pattern. Well, that can definitely cause problems. But if you have good movement, I mean, the, 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 the people who are old with the best ranges of motion, the best joints, the best joint health are people who exercise, not people who sit around and don't move their bodies. So this is a, it's, there's just a false paradigm here that, mm. oh, you got to save your joint. Don't use it that much. Yeah. Much It doesn't work that way. The body either decides to strengthen and maintain a joint or it decides it doesn't need the joint anymore. Not moving it tells the body we don't need it anymore. Right, it's going to naturally prune that. That's it. 